Thank you, Sharon, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Um, I was looking around wondering who actually you were talking about. Um, it, uh, it really is a, is a great um, a privilege to be here, um, particularly uh, for many reasons. It's a, it's a wonderful meeting, but um, I'm a cardiologist. So what's a cardiologist doing at a, at a brain meeting? So <clears throat> let me tell you why. Um, through our work at the uh, Stem Cell Institute, we've become very interested in how the body heals itself, and we think that's one of the, the key clues and one of the things that we've missed in, in medicine and biology for, for the last couple of centuries. So I'm going to talk about how stem cells can spark the regenerative powers of the human brain. Uh, all of the work that I'm going to talk to you about is, has been done at the University of Miami at the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute and at the company Longevron that licensed uh, technologies from the uh, University of Miami. All of our work has been uh, published in the scientific literature, and if anybody has any, uh, any wants more details about anything I've said, please, I urge you to, to email me, and I can send you original uh, scientific publications. So these are the four areas I'd like to cover. Can the human brain regenerate itself? How can this regeneration be harnessed to treat incurable diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or even uh, mood disorders like depression? What, are the, what is the role of stem cells in this, and what does this mean for human health and aging? So I'm going to start out with uh, regeneration. What is regeneration? And this is actually the, uh, the thing that got me interested in this, in this field. Much of what I've done as an adult, I realized, was sparked by uh, events that occurred to me as a child, and I was always fascinated about this. There are animals who live on this earth that if you remove a limb, or if they lose a limb, it'll, it'll grow back completely normally. This is the Mexican salamander regrowing its, uh, its leg. The Middle Eastern newt is another example of an animal that can, um, can completely regrow a limb. Now, our perception of ourselves is that we can't regenerate. And in fact, when I was in medical school in the, in the 80s, we were taught that uh, humans have no regenerative capability. That's why a human being cannot regrow a limb, uh, or for that matter, a heart or a brain or any organ that's injured. There were exceptions to that. We know we can regrow skin if it's injured. We know that the liver can regrow. And that goes back to a story actually in Greek, Greek mythology. The Greeks appreciated that the liver could regrow. But with the heart and the brain or limbs, not in humans. Why am I showing you a picture of a, a nuclear explosion? Um, this actually, the fact that nuclear uh, uh, bombs were exploded in the atmosphere gave scientists a very valuable tool that allowed us to completely change our thinking about the heart and the, uh, and the brain. So when nuclear bombs are exploded, they release uh, a, a variation of carbon into the atmosphere, carbon-14, and that can be used by scientists to date the cells in our body when a human being dies. And it was uh, these, types of, um, these, these types of experiments that showed, and this is a classic uh, paper from Spalding et al. published just, uh, just five years ago. We talked about five years being uh, changing the world. That showed that the hippocampus, which is linked to the amygdala, which we heard about before, had when people died, typically about 33% of the cells in the hippocampus were new. They had been developed in those people's brains after they had been born. And so this really shook things up. This means that uh, uh, key organs like the brain, and this is also true for the heart, do grow new cells um, after, we're, after we're born, and they do so in adulthood. And it's estimated from this study that we grow 700 new cells in the hippocampus every single day. And I think this is very importantly linked to sleep. I believe that the new neurons uh, are growing more preferentially when we, uh, when we are sleeping than when we're awake. And so perhaps this is yet another reason why a sleep deprivation is so important. It might, it might delay this. Um, here are a couple, a couple of the key papers. Uh, the, the first paper that reporting, uh, reported new cells in the hippocampus was actually published in 1998, but the critical one that actually measured the number of uh, neurons was published in 2013. 
So what does this mean for disease? Well, it means that we have to rethink all of the diseases, uh, the chronic diseases of adulthood. They're not just diseases of degeneration or loss of cells. There's actually a balance between new cells growing and new cells being lost. And perhaps if we can reshift that balance, uh, we, can, um, we can heal diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is um, uh, this, uh, the picture in the corner is of my colleague, uh, Barry Baumel who runs the Alzheimer's Center at the University of Miami. And uh, he and I worked together to develop a stem cell trial for Alzheimer's disease, which we'll hear a lot about this uh, afternoon. I won't go through it in, in detail. But we tend to think that Alzheimer's is due to the deposition of abnormal proteins in the, in the brain, which therefore causes the brain to lose these cells that are so critical to cognition. And currently, there's no available cure. There have been decades of work hundreds of millions of dollars spent with very little success, although there was a success just mentioned last week by the company Biogen. But over, by and large, 20 years of huge amount of research, uh, no success. Now, uh, this is a picture. Uh, this is a cartoon picture of what the brain looks like in a patient with Alzheimer's. And you can see it's completely shrunken. And very importantly, the hippocampus, which is this area that's enriched for growing new neurons, is also uh, shrunken. And we think it's because of the deposition of these amyloid proteins and these tau proteins that damage the neurons and cause it uh, to shrink away. Um, there's something we've missed in Alzheimer's disease that's also very important in mood disorders, and that is the role of inflammation in the brain. This, is the, this uh, picture is, um, is, my, is my colleague, uh, Charles Nemiroff, who's the head of psychiatry at the University of Miami. And he and I have had many discussions how stress leads to inflammation in the brain and how this can contribute to mood disorders. And this, this has a, uh, uh, been a guiding principle in our work with stem cells, which, which I'll come to next. So the general idea is that perhaps what we've missed with Alzheimer's disease is addressing the neuroinflammation, which could also be important in mood disorders. And what we've come to learn in our studies is that inflammation prevents the growth of new cells in the body under, under conditions of injury. So inflammation leads to reduced tissue regeneration, which contributes, our hypothesis is that it contributes to degenerative brain diseases, mood disorders, aging, and other degenerative diseases. So can we do anything about this? And this is, this is absolutely critical and is a driving influence in, in the work that we've done with stem cells. So what are stem cells and how can they help the body heal itself? This uh, beautiful picture of stem cells was taken by a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory, Christina Sinina, who's now doing her medicine residency in New York. And this shows the stem cells in green and heart muscle cells showing how these stem cells, if you culture them together, will bind together and the stem cells will transmit factors into the, uh, the, uh, the muscle cells and cause their health to be imp improved. And through this research, we've understood that there are four things that stem cells can do, at least four, there are others. They can reduce inflammation, very critical to what I said before about brain diseases. They can re reduce scar tissue. They can stimulate new blood vessel growth. And very, very importantly, our research shows, the research of our lab and many others, is that they stimulate new tissue to form from precursor cells and from cell division. So we think that we can use mesenchymal stem cells to stimulate that body regeneration that we have innately. I showed you the, uh, the, the data that shows that there are 700 new cells formed in the hippocampus per day, and we can use mesenchymal stem cells to increase that number. Um, mesenchymal stem cells I th should be thought of as a drug, a biological drug, a new generation of biological drugs, and they can be manufactured in the laboratory. You all hear a lot about clinics throughout the world and even in the United States that are giving you uh, stem cell therapy. I urge you, if you speak or interact with any of these clinics, ask them to tell you exactly what, what it is they are claiming as a stem cell because a stem cell is defined by two things. One, it can grow and divide, and two, it can turn into another tissue. And so we use that property of growth and division to manufacture the cells from normal human healthy donors, as shown here. We take their bone marrow, 
we culture it in a special system, and then we package it and we, we quality control it. We make sure it is what we think it is, and this is very important for the FDA. The FDA demands that if you're going to give a patient a stem cell drug under an IND, that you be able to uh, measure exactly what it is, and we do that as shown in that, in that, in that panel on the uh, bottom left. We measure the cell surface receptors, and then we're able to give that back to a patient as a drug. Now, um, the first thing is, the first thing I've told you is that mesenchymal stem cells reduce inflammation, and we've published that in a number of studies. This is a study measuring a marker of inflammation called tumor necrosis factor. Uh, this study was done by Samuel Gulpanian, another postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory. And these are people, these are older individuals who have very moderately elevated levels of tumor necrosis factor. And you can see in a dose response fashion how we can suppress that TNF alpha by 80% and keep it suppressed. And this is very important. This is the property that we believe is important for using mesenchymal stem cell infusions for Alzheimer's disease and depression. Um, now, also, there is some role for stem cells to be introduced into the body to actually, to actually participate in growing new tissue, and this works a lot better in animals than it does in humans, as is typically the case. This is a very famous study where, uh, done in mice, where an investigator labeled the, the stem cells in green, injected it into the mouse brain, and you can see in the hippocampus the growth of new neurons, those beauti that beautiful green structure that cell originated from the stem cell. So there is some role for stem cells replacing tissue in addition to causing regeneration of tissue. So we have ongoing clinical trials right now, and these are done under INDs, as Sharon mentioned. So these are done in the United States with um, authorization of the Food and Drug Administration. And I want to tell you about two trials in particular, and if anybody's interested in these trials, wants to refer somebody to these trials, please don't hesitate to contact me. The one we're very excited about is the first in the United States, a trial which is a phase one trial sponsored by Longevron and with support from the Alzheimer's Association to treat patients with early stage Alzheimer's disease with mesenchymal stem cells. And another is being conducted at the University of Miami with Charlie Nemiroff, supported by the National Institute for Drug Abuse, is to look at patients with treatment-resistant depression. And we think we can help those patients as well by offsetting their neuroinflammation. We even think that mesenchymal stem cells can be useful in treating aging and aging-related conditions like frailty, which is a very, very big problem worldwide as the population ages. And again, we are taking advantage of anti-inflammatory effects, the fact that these cells can home to sites of inflammation, and then again, the pro-regenerative effects, the fact that the cells can stimulate uh, endogenous tissues to repair. We all know that aging is associated with sarcopenia, where we lose muscle mass, and our hypothesis is that stem cells, the stem cells I've described to you, can offset that. So in aging populations, we are studying the fact that um, the stem cell infusions might be able to improve sarcopenia, boost cognitive function, improve cardiovascular function, and even boost the immune system to, uh, to offset uh, aging-related uh, deterioration and functional capacity. I told you I'm a cardiologist. I must end by at least giving you uh, one word about the heart. The uh, pictures on the left show what the heart looks like, the damaged area of the heart uh, after a heart attack. This scar tissue, if I can get the pointer to work. Right there, that's uh, the area of damage to the heart. And that's how, we, how much repair we can get with injections of stem cells. And again, what was so exciting to us, and this was really one of the first clues that allowed us to believe that mesenchymal stem cells stimulate that endogenous repair. This picture over here shows cells, cardiac myocytes, in cell division, and th there's an actual cell undergoing what's called mitosis, dividing into two, and this was upregulated, increased by about 20-fold in animals who had received injections of mesenchymal stem cells into the damaged area. So the field of using mesenchymal stem cells for uh, heart disease is very far along, and there's a phase three trial being conducted now, which means that approval for this um, treatment for patients with heart failure is imminent. 
uh, Congress actually got involved in the stem cell field in uh, 2016, and part of a new law called the 21st Century Cures Act gave the FDA new powers to stimulate the, um, to, uh, to uh, accelerate the approval of stem cell therapies. So, what have I told you today? Uh, stem cells represent a brand new approach to treating degenerative diseases of the brain and the body, and this is very, very exciting to, to doctors and scientists now. Um, uh, what I didn't go into in great detail is that stem cells can be given from one donor to another person without requiring any uh, immunosuppression. They reduce inflammation and they promote tissue regeneration in organs as diverse as the brain and the heart and many other organs. And this has provided us an opportunity to have a new treatment strategy, which we now have in clinical testing in about 15 or 16 different disease states. Um, neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration, aging, and other disorders are key areas in which uh, there's very active research in the United States right now. I'm very fortunate to uh, direct a very, very talented team of uh, scientists and trainees at the University of Miami. This is the picture of the current uh, uh, team, the, the team roster. And we've been very, very fortunate to have a magnificent funding from the NIH going back to 2005 with a number of these very important um, uh, mechanisms. And finally, I should also acknowledge the Alzheimer's Association that's funding the phase one trial. Several foundations have also supported our work, the SOFA family, the Starr Foundation, and the Marcus Foundation. Thank you very much.